Hi, my name is Adam Beach, and I am the Dean of the Graduate School at Ball State. We are so excited to welcome you to our fourth annual three-minute thesis competition, which showcases our amazing students and their fascinating research projects. The three-minute thesis competition asks students to think carefully about how to communicate with people outside of their fields and even people outside of the university. The goal is to help others understand and hopefully to support and become invested in the student's research and the wider academic enterprise of research and scholarship. It's not easy to summarize a 70-page thesis or 200-page dissertation in three minutes, yet 27 fearless students took up this very task. You will hear tonight from those who made it through the first round of judging, our 10 finalists who will no doubt get you involved in and excited about their work. I know I speak for our graduate faculty when I say that we feel fortunate to be able to work with our graduate students. In my position as the Dean, I'm reminded every day about the importance of graduate students to Ball State. We marvel at them, their persistence in the face of the extra difficulties posed by COVID, their grit and determination, their creativity and adaptability, and their refusal to quit. Our graduate students challenge us in essential ways and bring their passion to our partnerships on various research, teaching, and service projects. The energy of our students and their excitement to learn enlivens our graduate programs and departments. They have helped us keep moving forward as a university community during this life-changing pandemic. I am thankful to the 27 students who participated in this year's event and shared their work with us. I also want to thank all of our Ball State graduate faculty who have worked tirelessly with their students to adapt and complete their research projects. Behind each of the projects you see tonight is a group of faculty who mentored, pushed, and guided their students. After you watch the students' presentations tonight, I'm sure that you will share with me a sense of admiration for their work. I love the enthusiastic way they talk about their research. I love to hear them explain the importance of their projects. I love to see their sense of possibility for a better future, one in which people can use their curiosity intellect and hard work to make a difference and add to our knowledge and understanding. I find them very inspirational as we continue to weather this pandemic and look forward to better days. Before we get to the program, I wanna thank all those who helped pull off this year's 3MT competition, especially our faculty advisor and MC Nathan Hitchens, as well as Courtney Quinn and Michelle Miller from our graduate school team, our associate dean Stephanie Simon-Dack, all of the faculty who helped in the preliminary judging, and our partners Ted Buck and UMC and Paul Brown and University Media Services. Thanks to all of you for helping to showcase the work of our students. And now I will turn things over to our MC for this evening, Nathan Hitchens. Thank you, Adam. I'm Nathan Hitchens. I'm an assistant professor of geography and meteorology, and I'd also like to welcome you to our three-minute thesis competition. So, a little bit of background about what the three-minute thesis is. It was developed at the University of Queensland, and at the time it was developed, the state of Queensland and Australia was under a severe drought, and residents had to conserve water. Many started using three-minute egg timers to time how long they had in the shower, and during one of these three-minute showers, the dean of the University of Queensland Graduate School had an idea. He thought, well, if we can take showers in three minutes, maybe a graduate student could explain their research in three minutes, which is a huge undertaking considering that graduate studies and the research involved you know, result in these theses and dissertations that are you know, very, very long. So distilling it to three minutes is quite the task, but also quite important to share your research with others. So that's what was undertaken. And in 2008, the first three-minute thesis competition was held at the University of Queensland. The next year, they promoted this competition to other Australian and New Zealand universities. And it caught on there so much so that between 2010 and 16, the University of Queensland began hosting multinational competitions. Now, the three-minute thesis is held at more than 900 universities in more than 65 countries worldwide. 
A number of, of people from across the university helped us to get to where we are tonight by do, being preliminary judges for all of our, of our contestants. So the judges that got us here are Lynn Bielski from the Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology, Jackie Buckrop from the Department of Communication Studies, Dom Karisti from the Department of Media, Sungwon Chun from the School of Journalism and Strategic Communication, Michelle Glowacki Dudka from the Department of Educational Studies, Alexandria Johnson from the Department of Psychological Science, Jerry Reynolds from the Department of Social Work, and Stephanie Simon Dack from the Department of Psychological Science. And I'd also like to recognize all of those preliminary round participants that submitted videos and our, our preliminary round judges viewed those videos and 10 of these, uh, these participants are going to be featured here tonight as finalists. The rules of the competition tonight are actually quite simple. The first is the most obvious that there is a three minute time limit. So a strict three minute limit uh, during which the presentation must take place. Anything beyond three minutes is disqualified. Second, each participant can have a single static PowerPoint slide. So that means there's no transitions, no uh, motion, no music, nothing other than just a slide. Uh, they can't have any additional props, so only their person. They can't have um, a beaker or an instrument or you know, some other prop that would help to convey their research. And presentations are strictly spoken words, so there's no songs, no chants, no raps, no you know, anything beyond just a typical spoken word presentation. So how are our judges going to assess these, these different presentations that are from students in uh, very different areas of our university? So the first general area is comprehension and content. So this addresses things like how well was the research introduced? So looking at the background, the significance, did they provide enough background and really lay the groundwork for what, what importance their study has and how well was the research design explained did they go through the methods adequately enough that you know it's understood what they did to carry out their research and were the results conclusions and outcomes described well you know all those things that that they found were those presented very well so they could be understood and then there's another side of things, engagement and communication, because a presentation is more than just you know, the content itself, it's how well the presenter presents. So did they capture and hold the attention of the judges? You know, did those uh, presenters make their work comprehensible, meaning they avoided jargon? Because remember, this is university-wide. It's not one single department, one single college. You know, you have to be able to, as a presenter, tell your work to everyone. And lastly, how well did that PowerPoint slide enhance the presentation? So that PowerPoint slide is there to add something to what the presenter is, is telling us and how well did they accomplish that. So now that we understand the judging criteria, Let's take a little bit of a look at our judging panel for tonight. First is Adam Beach, Dean of the Graduate School. Uh, Dr. Beach is a professor of English and earned his PhD from SUNY Buffalo and served as an administrator in Ball State's English department for 10 years, including a three-year stint as the department chair. Along with 15 published articles on nationalism, slavery, and colonialism, in 18th century British literature, he co-edited a collection of essays invoking slavery in the 18th century British imagination. He also co-founded the Digital, Digital Literature Review Immersive Learning Project. Dr. Beach has worked closely with many masters and PhD students and is thrilled to help support graduate education and graduate students in his position as Dean of the Graduate School. 
Susan McDowell is our Vice Provost for Research. In addition to Vice Provost for Research, Dr. McDowell is a professor of biology. She earned her PhD from the University of Cincinnati and was a postdoctoral fellow at Lilly Research Laboratories in Indianapolis. At Ball State, she taught within the biotechnology program for 15 years prior to her current role and has worked with more than 50 students in her research lab. These students are co-authors on publications, have received their own internal and external funding, and most are pursuing and sustaining careers within the biotechnology field after graduation. Finally, we have Jennifer Mearns, Ball State's First Lady. Mrs. Mearns holds a bachelor degree from Bryant University, where she served for nine years on the Board of Trustees, including three years as Vice Chair. She has nearly two decades of experience in executive recruiting and talent acquisition, having started her search career as a partner with Teamwork Consulting, a boutique executive search firm specializing in the sports marketing industry. Mrs. Mearns founded JPM Consulting Services in 2003, which provides executive recruiting, talent acquisition, talent assessment, and general organizational consulting to a wide variety of clients. She actively serves on a number of not-for-profit boards focusing on education and children and families in need. At the conclusion of our presentations, uh, Susan McDowell will be announcing our award winners. We'll be giving out awards for first place, which will receive $1,000, second place will receive $700, and third place will receive $500. And now, on to our finalist presentations. First, we have Lakeisha Johnson from the School of Kinesiology. Lakeisha is originally from the great city of Chicago and loves studying ways in which our healthcare system can better utilize its resources to encourage, empower, and educate our local and global communities about better health policies and practices. She aspires to run her own preventative medicine clinic one day that engages her community's needs for health and well-being. Her presentation is titled, Effects of aerobic exercise on arterial stiffness induced by a mental task in black young adults. When you think about the American healthcare system, would you really call it healthcare or would you consider it as sick care? Health professionals historically have always been much more reactionary to the health decline of our society rather than proactive in using our resources to prevent it. This way of approaching medicine is understandable. You don't necessarily drink Dayquil before you have a cold or take Pepto-Bismol before you have a stomach ache. But what we find with many chronic diseases is that it isn't enough to treat the symptoms of a disease without ever addressing the cause and aiming to prevent it. Preventing chronic disease, in fact, is much more humane and produces less suffering. So if primary prevention is indeed the real medicine, why not use this strategy in our modern healthcare practices? Of the known chronic illnesses, Cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide. In America alone, we spend an estimated $363.4 billion a year on the cost of this condition. Billion, that's equivalent to buying every individual in Delaware County 16 Lamborghinis. Could you even imagine what you would do with 16 cars, nevertheless having 16 Italian luxury sports cars in your driveway? We can't even begin to imagine what we would do with all of that money individually, no less nationally. The data is even more striking when we study it based on the factor of race, of race and ethnicity. Black people are 32% more likely to die from heart disease than their white counterparts. So taking what we know about how economically, physically, and mentally oppressive cardiovascular disease is, concerns for how serious these diseases impact Black people are distressing. Cardiac problems in general cause such a severe reduction in quality of life. Naturally, we would expect gradual dysfunction as we get older. However, we find that mental stress in particular accelerates the aging process of our arteries, causing premature arterial stiffness. Studies have found that Black young adults especially report higher arterial stiffness measures. 
So not only are Black people dying more often from cardiovascular disease, they are also exhibiting premature indications of it in measures such as arterial stiffness. However, we have a potential solution. Exercise has been shown to be an impactful preventative mechanism for the effects of mental stress. It's quite interesting because both mental stress and exercise are forms of stressors that add work on the body. But exercise-related changes regulate stress in our arteries by decreasing arterial stiffness in a way mental stress cannot. So as we account for the detrimental effects of this disease in our society, we must draw a specific emphasis toward our Black communities. Thus, using preventative medicine, especially exercise, as a more economical and pain-friendly means gives us a better chance of reducing the human suffering caused by arterial stiffness. And also, we can reduce chronic diseases through this measure as well. Our next presenter is Misty Potts from Elementary Education. Misty is from South Whitley, Indiana, and is an assistant professor of education at Manchester University. She hopes to earn tenure and continue her research interests studying the development of pre-service teachers in higher education. She has published works in the Journal of STEM Teacher Education, Journal for the Education of the Gifted, and Open Textbook Library. She previously won first place for her completed research at the doctoral level in 2018 at the Graduate Student Research Gala at the National Association for Gifted Children in Minneapolis. Misty will be presenting Unlocking the Pre-Service Teacher Self-Efficacy Mystery. I don't know if my mentor teacher will think I'm stupid if I ask this question. I'm not sure if I know how to engage these students. These are a few of the thoughts pre-service teachers may experience when they're thinking about how successful they'll be during student teaching. This is also known as teacher self-efficacy. Teaching self-efficacy develops with early experiences in teaching and becomes a stable belief that is difficult to improve. Not only does it reflect teachers' beliefs in their own abilities to be successful in classrooms, but it has been shown to influence teachers' decisions to stay in the profession. Teachers with high self-efficacy are less likely to leave their jobs, they have high impact on student achievement, and they have beneficial teaching characteristics. They're more resilient and they can manage challenging situations better. You might be wondering why I'm talking about teaching self-efficacy when we already know so much about it. I'll tell you. Enrollment in teacher education programs has dwindled while teachers are leaving the profession in droves. Almost all teaching education programs require some form of student teaching, yet we don't understand the unique ways individuals develop teaching self-efficacy during student teaching or what information influences that development. My study explored the different ways pre-service teachers experience the development of student teaching, of teaching self-efficacy during student teaching. I interviewed pre-service teachers who had just graduated from a private university with their unique experiences and perspectives fresh on their minds. I had a lot of information about their teacher education program, and therefore I could provide rich details about their context and experiences. The data showed pre-service teachers are drawn to specific and different sources of information with different frequencies when developing their teaching self-efficacy. They also interpret this information in different ways, either positively or negatively influencing their development. Four patterns of teaching self-efficacy among these pre-service teachers were observed. I noticed the groups of pre-service teachers were drawn to specific sources of information. They had tendencies to interpret these sources positively or negatively. They had similar levels of self-efficacy and similar experiences prior to student teaching. My analysis showed that teacher education programs can implement three elements to improve self-efficacy. One is early mastery experiences, two, aligning expectations across programs, and three, providing effective feedback. By helping pre-service teachers improve teacher self-efficacy, we can create positive learning environments with more enthusiastic teachers who are less likely to feel teacher burnout or leave the teaching profession. Up next is Riley Carroll from Communication Studies. Riley is from the Southwest Chicago suburbs and came to Ball State to pursue her master's after finishing her bachelor's degree in interpersonal communication 
at Illinois State University. Her research focuses on gender, violence, resistance, and rituals. Riley has presented her work at several conferences during her time at Ball State, winning multiple top paper awards at the Central States Communication Association Conference. Riley hopes to continue researching after graduation and intends to pursue her doctorate. Riley will be speaking on, I'll cast a spell for you, a critical rhetorical analysis of witches resistance on the public screen. In 2020, people across the country reacted to the murder of George Floyd and gathered to resist the long legacy of racism and police brutality in the United States. One group cast spells for change. While these witches' involvement may seem a bit fantastical, it's actually not that surprising. Throughout history, when oppression against marginalized people increases or becomes more public, there is also often an uptick in practicing witches. Their modern day meeting place? TikTok, a video sharing social media platform. My thesis seeks to investigate how the witches on TikTok rhetorically utilize their witchcraft for resistance during the summer of 2020. To do so, I perform a rhetorical criticism, examining TikToks from the most followed witch on the platform with 1.4 million followers at Chaotic Witch Aunt. The account is run by white, gender fluid folk witch, Frankie Ann Castania, whose videos focus on bridging their witchcraft with advocacy. Since the practice of witchcraft focuses on rituals, I ask the question, what role does ritual play in Chaotic Witch Aunt's resistance? Additionally, since little communication research has been done on TikTok, I also wanna know, how does TikTok function to enable or inhibit resistance? Through my analysis, I uncover how Chaotic Witch Aunt utilizes the elements of TikTok, such as the duet and text overlay functions, as well as the lip syncing and performance trends to help ensure their messages dissemination. These elements are utilized ritualistically or in a repetitive, formalized, aesthetic manner to create what I call resistive feminist rhetorical rituals that combat racism by using feminine rhetorical strategies, such as coalition building, by calling on witches to participate in the movement and then actually giving them the tools to do so. However, the success of TikTok videos relies on an algorithm. If creators like Chaotic Witch on whose whiteness already helps them gain views, stray from what the algorithm deems as watchworthy, their resistance will go unobserved. In conclusion, it is clear that magic and its rituals have played a role in the revolution, but TikTok holds the potential to decide just how big that role is. Thank you. Julia Balain is our next presenter from Speech Pathology and Audiology. Julia is from Greenwood, Indiana. She's going to Newport, California to do her fourth year rotation at the Newport Mesa Audiology Balance and Ear Institute. Her career aspirations are to specialize in vestibular disorders, which are balance disorders. The title of her presentation is Attitudes Toward and Effects of Prolonged Noise Exposure Among Motorcyclists. I want you to take a break from listening to presentations and notice three things that you hear. You may hear a dishwasher running if you're at home. You may hear a conversation from down the hallway at school, or you may hear a dog barking from outside. The exact mechanisms of how the sound waves travel to our brain for interpretation is a delicate system. What we do know is that this system could be damaged by loud sounds. Loud sounds break off and damage the hair cells in our organ of hearing, just like how a lawnmower breaks the tips off grass. Growing up, my dad always had a rule. Whenever you mow the lawn, you have to wear earplugs. 
I thought it was strange that, that my dad had this rule, but he never wore earplugs when he rode his motorcycle, which was also pretty loud. This sparked my doctoral project, which examined motorcyclists' attitudes and effects of noise exposure. This project was important to me because 8 million motorcycles, including my dad's, are registered in the United States. After approval from the IRB, I created a Qualtrics survey that distributed motorcycles to group pages. I also called all the motorcycle stores in Indiana, and I asked if they sold any form of hearing protection. On the survey, when the question was asked, I wear hearing protection devices when I ride a motorcycle, 47% of the 57 respondents said, never. This statistic stood out to me because when asked if they wore other protection gear, only 6% said, never. This started to paint a picture. What this told me was that just like my dad, motorcyclists who wore protection gear were wearing everything except hearing protection. What was even more interesting was that of the 28 stores that answered my phone call, only 25% of them had any form of hearing protection. My dad now wears hearing protection when he rides his motorcycle, but as an audiologist, whose role is to advocate and educate hearing health, my job is not done. Our next presenter is Sally Kelly from the School of Music. Sally was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and currently resides in Muncie. She finished her coursework for her Doctor of Arts degree in choral conducting with a secondary emphasis in entrepreneurial music. In 2019, she was awarded the Purim Scholarship for Women of Achievement. She has been invited to conduct in England and Argentina, and she recently presented a poster session at the National Collegiate Choral Organization's conference. Currently, she is Executive Director of Masterworks Chorale in Muncie, Artistic Director for White River Sound in Indianapolis, and an Adjunct Instructor at Anderson University. Tonight, she's speaking on Criterion for Tune, Identifying New England Lead Traits of Alice Parker's Choral Settings of Emily Dickinson Poetry. Concession. I hated Emily Dickinson. Well, her poetry. Truly, I didn't understand it. I found it insufferably oblique. Just tell me, Emily. Then, in choir in grad school, we started rehearsing a piece by Alice Parker, also a New Englander, in which she set seven of Dickinson's poems to music. We rehearsed the piece over and over, and somewhere in the repetition of each phrase, something unlocked. For the first time, I understood Dickinson. In one of the rehearsals, the director read a quote by the composer Parker, in which she describes the music as having a New Englandly sound. Well, what does that mean? How can music be New Englandly? That's not even a word. Well, the term New Englandly actually comes from a Dickinson poem in which she says, because I see New Englandly. The term has since been used by literary scholars to describe characteristics of Dickinson's poetry, like satire, irony, multiplicities of meaning, transcendentalism, juxtaposition. So this gave me the what is New Englandly, but then I read a book by Christiane Miller that gave me the how. She describes five ways that Dickinson uses unconventional grammar, compression, disjunction, repetition, syntax, and speech. These elements are how Dickinson achieves that New Englandly sound. So how does this apply to Alice Parker's music? Well, Parker's approach to composition is also unconventional. She doesn't use traditional concepts of harmony, but rather starts with melody. So I would need a new way of analyzing music, one that focused on melody. I chose three choral cycles with multiple settings of Dickinson poetry, 
Then by focusing on the intersection of text and tune, I discovered that the same five characteristics of Dickinson's unconventional grammar could be found in Parker's unconventional composition techniques. Parker uses compression through her mood markings and layering of multiple melodies. She uses disjunction through rests, articulations, and unexpected harmonies. She uses textual and musical repetition to paint the text. Parker mimics Dickinson's syntax through her short phrase structures, her use of silence and contrast. And finally, through choral music, Parker gives literal voice to the speech-like characteristics of Dickinson's poetry. Suddenly, my experiences in those rehearsals made sense. I could now name what it was that unlocked Dickinson's poetry. Parker's unconventional composition techniques mirrored Dickinson's unconventional grammar, allowing the words of the poet to live. Next up is Catherine Curtin Johnson from History. Catherine was born in South Africa and moved to the United Kingdom after her bachelor's degree in art history at the University of Cape Town. She moved to Indiana in 2010 with her family and owns a small farm and restaurant in Upland. She decided to continue her education in history in 2020 and hopes to continue on to a PhD at a university in Indiana. Her presentation is titled, Permissible Devotion, Women's Changing Faith Practices Over the English Reformation. George MacDonald said, never tell a child you have a soul, teach him you are a soul, you have a body. The body was as integral to medieval humanity's spiritual experience on earth as it was to the afterlife. But the Reformation and Enlightenment brought a change to the way people understood themselves. Medieval English women, for example, had great responsibility in life cycle rituals, such as childbirth, the sickbed, and the deathbed. And their daily domestic practices included physical religious rituals, such as marking hours of prayer with the rosary, lighting candles, or burning incense. Objects like statues, crucifixes, and paintings were central to the sensory and embodied experience of medieval church worship. But with the rise of Protestantism, religious practices that were not based on scripture were at times forbidden. Not only were churches stripped of physical objects in worship, but spiritual practices not found in scripture were perceived as superstitious, idolatrous, or even witchcraft. With many traditional domestic practices now forbidden, how did women respond in their daily life? My study of early modern English devotional works written for women, as well as domestic objects, shows us that women did not simply forsake their traditional practices and replace them with new ones. Instead, we see a more nuanced transition. With English translations of the Bible and the printing press being key to Protestant reforms, the book became the most important object in worship. Instead of women's role in caring for the whole physical and spiritual person, they were now expected to be the moral teacher and guide for their household. A deeper look at the evidence, though, shows us that women still held on to their valued traditions by adjusting their domestic religious habits to make them acceptable to the new status quo. Where women once wore the rosary for our hourly prayer, they now hung tiny prayer books on their belts. The language of prayer now in English still referred to bodily expressions of spiritual experience, such as weeping, groaning, or falling. While religious iconography was removed from the church, women decorated their homes and belongings with biblical scenes and moral sayings. Although the emphasis had shifted away from the body and objects in church worship, women held on to their physical and sensory practices in their domestic devotional life. Eventually, many of the medieval religious ways would disappear, but my study of women's domestic devotional practice has shown that when cataclysmic social change comes, people may not give up their traditional ways immediately. Instead, they adapt the practices they value the most and create hybridized traditions that reflect their identity while remaining acceptable to the new status quo. Tricia Martin is our next speaker from Architecture and Historic Preservation. 
Trisha is a transplanted Iowan who is earning dual master's degrees in architecture and historic preservation and a certificate in social and environmental justice. She has dual bachelor's degrees in art history and history with a certificate in museum studies from the University of Iowa. She wishes to work as a preservation architect for a large firm to create new uses and purposes for old dilapidated historic buildings. Her presentation is titled, Changing Perceptions. How many of us have driven by a jail and immediately felt uncomfortable? How many of us have walked next to or under an interstate Passover? Is it possible to change the perception of a place through design? Architecture and historic preservation will work in conjunction in the redesign of the former Marion County Jail 2 building in downtown Indianapolis to create a destination that encourages community relations between downtown and the Near East Side neighborhood that at one time had been continuous, but was separated by the construction of Interstate 65 and 70. Creating an intersection of community services, an affordable grocery, a collection of three different housing types, and ample green space. This location has the chance of generating a missing destination integral to the community. This building was built over a period of four years in the early 1910s for the Cole Motor Car Company. The Cole Motor Car Company made several important advancements to the history of the motor car in America, including creating the first car with four closable doors in 1910, and trademarked the term standardized to describe their cars in 1912 that is now used by industries around the world. The company closed its doors in 1925 and was a rental space for other businesses until Service Supply bought the building in 1969. Service Supply became the largest supplier of industrial fasteners in the US in, 1960, in 1981. Recognizing the historical significance of the coal building, they nominated the building for the National Register of Historic Places, and it was listed in 1983. The city of Indianapolis approached them in the early 1990s to move locations so they could expand their jail. The location of the building was ideal for the city because it was only seven blocks away from the existing jail just west on Washington Street. Since then, with the construction of the interstates occurring in the 60s and 70s, this historically significant location has become an eyesore to the point where people simply drive past without acknowledging it. Since the jail is in the process of moving to the newly built community justice campus several miles away, this building and location will sit empty. A redevelopment plan to reincorporate this building into the surrounding neighborhood and become a place for investment into the community is my answer. What once was a place of invention that morphed into a place of fear and isolation can soon become a destination integral to the community. Our next presenter is Kevin Hunt from Architecture. Kevin is from Laporte, Indiana, attended Ball State for his undergraduate degree in architecture, and has a focus in the digital design and fabrication program as part of his master's. For his future, he's aspiring to become part of the next step of space travel, seeing mankind inhabiting and colonizing the moon and Mars. His presentation is titled, Inflated Spaces. Space travel is becoming more and more mainstream every day. Private companies such as Blue Origin are making space tourism more affordable than ever, and SpaceX is rapidly iterating to bring interplanetary travel for humans into reality. Public government entities also hold vested interests to see their country succeed, becoming the first to colonize other celestial bodies. With colonization comes the demand for safe, comfortable, and affordable habitats for all to use and enjoy. Architects are now in a prime position to offer guidance and assistance to habitat manufacturers that balances the efficient and compact needs of the structure with the spatial experience and basic needs of the end users. Mars is Earth's closest planetary neighbor and provides a unique opportunity to expand the universal footprint of humans. Exploration is a natural human instinct, and the celestial bodies beyond Earth are prime and offer a new frontier for humans. 
Also, by diversifying the planetary living for humans, it will allow for many human civilizations to thrive, regardless of what may occur on a separate human inhabited planet. Rapid advancements will need to be made in order to prototype, test, and deploy Mars habitats and begin building another home for humanity. Currently, several different habitat styles exist in many forms, with the technologies behind these typically falling within one of three categories, sending a 3D printing robot to combine water and Martian soil into a single solid habitat, using frozen Mars ice water to create an exterior shell, or shipping a pre-manufactured habitat to be finally assembled on site. The issue with solely utilizing local Martian resources as the habitat, even though they are readily available, is the toxicity embedded within the water and soil that can pose health risks. Therefore, my habitat design will take advantage of the weight savings and space achievable with an inflatable membrane fabric held within a carbon fiber tube structure. This minimizes the complexity and potential points of failure, while allowing for the entire habitat to fold flat and ship to Mars using rocketry currently in development. With this size limitation, architects need to be involved to assist in balancing the compact interior spaces with the mental health and physical well-being of the inhabitants. Items such as lighting, air temperature, and spatial layout will need to be fully customizable to provide flexibility and reduce the stagnant nature of the habitat for the users. In order to demonstrate the long-term future success of Mars living, my design proposal looks at three separate state timelines, a six month, one year, and three year missions that continually build upon the last. With an efficient long-term human-centered habitat, this project will provide users with better long-term experiential living while providing structural optimizations and resiliency. This will bring the reality of Mars living to humanity within our lifetime and be the catalyst in helping humans to become a multi-planetary species. Deidre Bibbs from Educational Psychology is our next presenter. Deidre was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. She is currently a fourth year doctoral candidate and has successfully published two articles in addition to presenting at several conferences including the National Association of School Psychologists and American Psychological Association annual conventions. Having both professional and volunteer experience in advocacy and mentorship, Deidre aims to center her research on the intersection of race and gender and the school to prison pipeline. The title of Deidre's presentation is Black Girls, Discipline Policies, and Student Handbooks disproportionality and bias in schools. 11,205,797. That's the total number of days all students missed during the 2017-2018 school year due to out of school suspensions. What's hidden in that number are the black girls who when compared to all other female students were the only group where a disparity was observed being suspended almost twice their rate of enrollment in schools across the United States. Zero tolerance policies, which were initially introduced to address the war on drugs during the 1980s, now represent school policies that mandate predetermined consequences for specific actions with little to no flexibility. There's a significant link between zero tolerance policies disproportionate discipline practices, and subsequent patterns of juvenile delinquency and incarceration, this link being commonly referred to as the school to prison pipeline and school push out. Scholars have highlighted the rates of disproportionality in schools, often exclusively focusing on black boys and urban areas. And most have examined individual teacher bias as a factor that may be facilitating disproportionality. No existing literature provides a comprehensive, objective, critical analysis of student handbooks as a factor in discipline disproportionality. My study will objectively define, then identify the quantity of zero tolerance policies, dress code bias based on race and gender, and ambiguity in behavioral expectations and discipline sanctions all of which are found in student handbooks. I will be using the 2017-2018 school year discipline data from the Civil Rights Data Collection and collecting student handbooks from schools across the state of Indiana. Preliminary data shows that a higher prevalence of zero tolerance policies in student handbooks is correlated with higher disproportionality rates for black girls when compared to white girls. 
Preliminary data also shows that disproportionality rates for black girls when compared to white girls is higher than disproportionality rates for black boys when compared to white boys, potentially debunking the notion that black boys have it worse. Acknowledging the, the ways school policies and procedures create and perpetuate these disparities is a necessary first step in understanding and reversing the dynamics that contribute to school discipline disproportionality. It is only after these factors have been acknowledged that we can provide the necessary resources to ensure that all Black girls are given the genuine opportunity to learn. Our next presenter is Robert Graff from Architecture. Robert is from Floyd's Knobs, Indiana. His career aspirations are to become a licensed architect and start an architectural products business focused on digital design and fabrication. During his time at Ball State, he had the honor and privilege to work with several groups in the Muncie and Indianapolis areas. He hopes to continue this process in his career by working with local communities in order to design and develop shared spaces. He'll be speaking on Indiana Hardwood and Steel, Hybrid Mass Timber. Currently, the profession of architecture is concerned with sustainability. So what can architects do to help Indiana act upon the ideals of sustainability? Part of what makes architectural design sustainable is the use of local recyclable materials. This type of design reduces negative impacts the construction industry has on our local and global environments. In recent years, there has been a development of engineered wood products, which is a class of structure called mass timber. According to Fehi in the Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, wood buildings have 20 to 50% lower greenhouse gas emissions as compared to those with steel and concrete. Also, Wood stores carbon throughout its life instead of emitting the harmful gas into the environment. On the contrary, mass timber systems are not perfect. When long spans are introduced into a building design, very deep beams with thick floor plates are, in, are needed, which creates issues for electrical and mechanical systems integration. Also, mass timber structures are almost never all wood. Typically, Hidden steel plates and screws will be used at weak points, such as when a beam meets a column. Here, the steel is not being celebrated or even acknowledged for its efforts. On the other hand, some mass timber structures will employ pronounced steel plates and bolts. In this scenario, the steel and wood appear disjointed from each other. However, there is another problem. Mass timber producers are in states far from Indiana and this creates a significant amount of cost and carbon emissions for a project. This fact eliminates the sustainable benefit of using the system in the first place. With everything considered, I am proposing a novel hybrid mass timber system, which is composed of Indiana steel and Indiana hardwood, both materials produced and fabricated locally. The local quality of this proposal would benefit Indiana buildings in terms of carbon emissions, as well as transportation costs. The use of strong Indiana steel in places where mass timber is weakest will allow structural elements to reduce in size. Plus, hybrid mass timber will offer a new relationship between mass timber and steel instead of being hidden from occupants or impose itself on the wood. My thesis intends to address the current state of mass timber and sustainability in architecture, but it also seeks to provide Indiana industries with a solution. As part of this thesis, I will design and construct a full-scale model of what is possible regarding a hybrid mass timber system. This will provide a proof of concept, as well as an additional step toward a more sustainable Indiana. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our wonderful finalists. To close out our evening with the presentation of awards, here's Dr. Susan McDowell. Thank you, Nathan. Hello, my name is Dr. Susan McDowell, and I serve as the Vice Provost for Research. Mrs. Jennifer Mearns, Dr. Adam Beach, and I were the judges and determined the winners of the 2022 Three Minute Thesis Competition. Congratulations to each of the 10 finalists. I can say with 100% confidence, you will come away from this experience changed. The change may be in many forms. It may be in the way you now know that when you committed to doing this, you followed through. As you know, not everyone does that.
that trade alone can take you very, very far. It may be in the way you will look back and know that you did more than meet the bare minimum to get a degree. That too is huge. That too is notable. And that too can help you get to where you want to be. And it may be in the way that you will look back and know that you took a risk. To be able to take that risk was a privilege and you did not take it for granted. We celebrate this with you. And we hope the very best for each of you now as you go about completing those degree requirements. And now for the announcement of our first, second, and third place winners. Third place winner and recipient of $500 is Misty Potts. Congratulations, Misty. Second place winner and recipient of $700 is Riley Carroll, and congratulations to you, Riley. And finally, our first place winner and recipient of $1,000 is Sally Kelly, and congratulations, Sally. Congratulations again to all of you. Please keep in touch to let us know how you are, and more importantly, to continue to serve to inspire new students to make the most of this moment in their lives as you have in yours. Our very best to each one of you and thank you for joining us this evening.